requests like that. Um, give you something that you can actually take the time to go before the Lord with. Oh, we'll do that after. Thank you, sister. Forgetful. Um, but anyways, we're going we're gonna to start um, studying the book of Romans this evening. Naturally, being studying the book of Romans, we're going to start in the book of Acts. Uh, so if you take your Bibles, turn to the book of Acts, and we're going to start in chapter chapter 8. No, let's start in chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. I've encouraged you off and on to read through the book of Acts, or through the book of Romans. I mean, I should have had foresight to encourage you to read through the book of Acts because you'll get a lot of information there that will uh, bolster up what's going on so that you can have a greater understanding of what's going on in Romans. But I'm going to try and give you a brief little thing here on uh, uh, that as we look here in the book of Acts. So, Acts chapter 20, we'll just read a few verses here quickly and then you all may be seated. Acts chapter 20 and verse 1, it said, And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples, and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece. And there abode three months. When the Jews laid wait for him, he was about to sail into Syria. He purposed to return through Macedonia. And there accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalon uh, Thessalonians, Aristarchus, and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus, and Trophimus, these going before tarried for us at Troas. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray you bless the reading of your word, God. Give me unction from on high. Give me wisdom in the scriptures. Help me to be able to teach. Give me the gift of teaching, Father. I love you and I praise your name. I ask this to be blessed through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen and amen. Y'all may be seated. What we find here in Acts chapter 20 is he says, After the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him disciples. That uproar is the uproar that we kind of talked about. I think it may be the last time or the time before that when I preached uh, where they were there in these, um, what were they? They were silversmiths and they made the shrines and the gods and the goddesses uh, that people worship these uh, idols is what they worshipped. And so Paul was wanting to go up before him to cause... Uh, them a bit of trouble in their unholiness through his uh, righteous preaching, but he was held back and withheld, him, and uh, I think for a good reason, so that the Lord could use him in a different way. And in this we find that uh, after the upper word was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples, embraced them, and departed to go into Macedonia. So he's going up to Macedonia. When he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came in into Greece. We know that we find in Greece, um, the, the primary hub there for the church was uh, in Corinth. So we find that he's in Corinth during this time period. And it's generally accepted that it was during this time period that the book of Romans was written. Uh, so what we want to look back at in the chapter 18, we find in chapter 18, he said, After these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. So it was in Corinth. He found, a cert, he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. Uh, so we find that Paul met some people from Rome there uh, while he was in Corinth. And as he's coming back to Corinth, we find him being there, and it says that he was there for three months, uh, spending some time with the church at Corinth, no doubt, exhorting them and uh, uh, speaking with them. We find in the book of Corinthians how he talks about how, you know, I had spoken to you about these things, and you can only imagine the things that he probably spoke to them about. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, this is what we have. This is the Word of God. This is the canon of Scripture that God chose fit to give to us and praise God for it. Uh, but but I'd, I'd be real excited to sit there and listen to Paul for a few hours and just hear because you ever get next to somebody who's full of the Holy Ghost and the way that they talk about things is in light of the Holy Ghost and, and dwelling with and them walking in the Spirit of God. 
And there's something different about the way they talk about stuff. There's something different about their attitude. There's something different about the power behind what they say. Just imagine being next to the Apostle Paul, the one who was uh, caught up into the third heaven, the one who was out there in the desert of Arabia for three years uh, being ministered unto and, and given mysteries by the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, just imagine that. And you look at him and you see his service and you wonder, how was he so faithful? How could he have been so faithful like that? Well, imagine if you had seen everything he'd seen. Yeah. I mean, think about that. If you had taken hold of everything he had taken hold of, those lashings, those whippings, they were nothing. He said, they're, you know, we, uh, the present troubles of this evil world, there's nothing to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed in us. He says the troubles and trials we go through, there's nothing to be compared. It's nothing to be compared. Everything that we go through, it's nothing. It's, it's dung. It's, it's, it's lower than dirt. It's, you can't even see it with a microscope compared to the glory that is ahead for those that are born again, those that are bought with a price. So Paul was filled with power because of what he saw. But, but if Paul chose not to walk in the Spirit, guess what? What kind of an apostle would he have been if he chose not to walk in the Spirit? What kind of followers are we of Jesus if we choose not to walk in the Spirit? You see these people, I, you know, I hope y'all will pray for me. I'm going to go street preaching on Friday evening, um, late in the evening, so I'm, I'm sure that I'll get some of the more rowdy people. Um, and Lord willing, I have some that are going with me. Pastor, if he's able to, he's going to try and go with me, maybe a few other brethren. Um, and anybody that is, would like to go, contact me. We'll, we'll see about uh, uh, what we can have you do and, and where you can have, have you be a helper and a, uh, a fellow laborer in the gospel. Um, but you go out and you see all these people who give you this washed down, watered down form of Christianity where, it's, where sin is not the exception, it's the expectation. I see these people, and I've talked to them before, and I say, well, are you living for the Lord? Well, I sin every day like, like it's a duh thing. Like, obviously, I sin every single day. And I'm not talking about sinless perfection, but I'm talking about you can walk in the Spirit of God. Amen. And you may have a stumble, and you may have a fall here, and that's fine. And that's fine. Everybody's going to have that. You're going to have that temptation come up, but there's no temptation that's set before you that's greater than, than God gives you the escape for. I think he says in Thessalonians. He says that he'll, he'll make a way of escape when that hour of temptation comes. Most of us choose to enjoy the temptation and take hold of that rather than the escape because the temptation, that, that quick gratification of the desires of our heart and of our mind and of our flesh and of our, our will are greater than that of our desire towards the Lord. What, I said it the other day in my sermon. I said, what a weak and neutered generation of Christians we are. Me included half the time. I mean, amen. We're, we're all just about as, as whimsical as you can be when it comes to, uh, comes to walking in holiness. And uh, some of you that are in the older generation might be saying, yeah, you are. <laughs> I see it. Yeah, I see people like that. But we don't want to be like that. We want to be good servants of the Lord like Paul. But we don't need to see to be those good servants. Amen? Anyways, I don't want to get off on that. So he's over there and he's writing to the people in Rome. Now what we had found here is that at Rome there had been a decree... Uh, from Claudius, he commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. That's uh, what uh, Priscilla, uh, Aquila and Priscilla said. Uh, so what does that mean? That means uh, what, what is commonly assumed and asserted is that, uh, based upon historical documents and as well as testimony of Scripture, is that what was going on is the Jews and the Christians were kind of arguing that they were kind of combating each other. There was a little kind of a, a contention going on, not just a little bit, but probably quite a bit. And so the Jews were expelled. See, the people of the way were small, and it wasn't that big of a deal, but all these Jews are causing this uproar. See, the people of the way weren't causing the uproar, but they were kind of the spark for the Jew to cause the uproars and to cause the disturbances, so they were expelled. And that's Christian or not. He just said, that, get, get out, Jews, get out. That was kind of what was established. That's what everybody understood and knew. These people of the way, they're a little sect, and we're not worried about them. Uh, but anyways, uh, they had come out of Rome. And so I think that when we look at Romans, we see Paul 
And number one, we see him dealing with the world, and we see him dealing with the Jews, and then we see him dealing with the Gentiles as we look through chapters 1, 2, and 3. We kind of see him in not that particular order, but we see him dealing with those specific things. We see him dealing with Jews, that they're sinners, with Gentiles, that they're sinners, and that all people are sinners. Amen. He's just making the case all people are sinners. So as we find these Jews migrating back into Rome, they're, they're coming into something that is not so... Uh, 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 Jewish and more Gentilish, a, a church that's less Jewish and more Gentilish. Does that make sense? You say, what would be the difference between a church that's more Jewish and less, uh, 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 rather than Gentilish? Well, the Jews still had customs that they held to, uh, ways that they acted, things that they did, and that was fine. It's just that it wasn't something that they could require under under the grace of God. It was a, a Jewish law. But they, they still abided by the Jewish moral code as, as the Christian who were Gentiles would do. So as they're coming back, they're migrating back into um, uh, Rome. We're finding that there are a little bit of problems. And I think that Paul, a part of his idea here in Romans as he's approaching this of saying, you know, I just need you all to understand you're on the same level. Because yeah. Jews had kind of the idea that, well, we're righteous and the Gentile are what? Dogs, sinners, they're, they're, the, they're the unclean ones, they're the common things. You know, and, and that idea still came through as they were uh, converted in some instances. We see that with Peter, amen? We see how Peter failed in that way and how he stumbled and how he even came to sinning uh, because of his actions towards uh, those uh, and following with those Jews that forbade for eating with Gentiles. Uh, so we, you know, nobody's perfect, but we do want to strive to be, uh, live according to the scriptures. So that's what we're, he's kind of dealing with there. It's in these two different kind of areas are combating. Now let me tell you something. If you go to another country and you're one of these hard-lined Christian preachers that says that a, a, a person can't drink alcohol at all or you're a sinner. Well, number one, that doesn't exactly line up with the Bible. But number two, you go to a country where it's accepted and it's common and it's, 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 it's not something that people do in an immoral fashion, you're going to be in trouble with the brethren. You need to recognize that you're on the same plane. You need to recognize that you can't, just because that's something that's accepted in your life doesn't mean you can, you can throw that yoke of bondage upon somebody else. Now there are things that are good to do and good to not do, right? But... There are things that are good for you to not do, but okay for somebody else to do. Now, how they do that is up to them and the Lord, and if they do it righteously, is a whole other story. Some people do things to offend others. I had a friend who started drinking alcohol as a Christian, and I understood alcohol as the way that I've understood it now, but he did it in an offensive way, where he would do it in front of people who were drunkards at one point in time. That's a problem. So these Jews are there, and that's not exactly what's going on here in Romans. I'm just getting a little rabbit there. Um, the Jews are coming back, being assimilated back in Rome, and Paul's dealing with this idea here where they're probably having some issues. They went from being this majorly Jewish church to a more Gentile church. They was more established as Gentiles. So you've got their customs that are being entered in there. That's the point I'm making, that different groups have different customs. You know, God separated the nations, and those different nations have different customs, right? So Paul's writing this letter, and there he abode three months, in chapter 20 and verse 3, when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail into Syria. So Paul's about to leave Corinth, and he's written his letter. He's getting ready to leave Corinth. And guess what happens? The Jews are laying wait for him. There's something there. There's something there. This was the man that they would have been like, yeah, that's our champion as far as uh, Phariseeism. That's our champion. That's Saul, our champion. Now he's Paul, our enemy. Hey, Amen? What does that tell you? I mean, those Jews would have gone to bat for him back when he was Saul of Tarsus. Amen? Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Do the people in your life that are from your life in sin, do they go to bat for you now as a Christian? No. If they do, there might be a problem. 
Now, if you've not lived long enough and not gotten into the wicked things that most of us have gotten into, then there might be a different story there. But if those that are lost and outside of the grace of God and outside of the body of Christ are there defending you, and not defending you from an outside point of view where they're saying, well, in spite of me disagreeing with you, I'm talking about where they're just vehemently defending you, like, yeah, 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 you're exactly right. But they're lost and they're going to hell. There's a problem there. There should be a concern in your life. Now, I'm not saying that lost people have to hate you, but guess what? They hated your Savior. Not those that came to Him weary. Not those that came humbly, that were seeking salvation. But those that opposed themselves unrighteously, guess what? They were some angry folks at Jesus. They tried to kill Him on many occasions till He gave His life up for, for the crucifixion. But they're going to hate you and let them hate you for loving them. Amen. 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 They can't understand. That's exactly right. And the cultural thing you're talking about, cultural stuff. Paul in Romans 3 gets into this about circumcision. In Romans 2, he talks about circumcision, keeping the law, and this and that. Other half profits nothing if you violate the law. And uh, they just got through in Acts chapter 15 having a big uh, uh, argument you know, yeah. with the, the Judaizers, the Pharisees who, who had come to faith, saying that you had to be circumcised, keep the law of Moses, or you couldn't be saved. Yeah. And they came out with the sentence that that's not so. It don't have to be like that. Yeah. Uh, Gave them four things. from blood. And from fornication, if you do these things, you fare thee well. That's what James and and uh, Peter and all the apostles said there in, in uh, Jerusalem. And then after they'd established the fact that circumcision was nothing, that it meant nothing, in Acts 16, when Paul is taking Timotheus and going on a missionary journey, first he circumcises Tim. Amen. You know why he did that? Because it was a cultural thing. Amen. So he would be received and would be offense, an offense to those around him and automatically be rejected. Amen. I, I'm all things to all men that I by some means might win some. some. Amen. It, that's a really good point he makes there. And let's, put it in, let's put it in another terminology. Say you go to a country. Say you go to a country where it is completely inappropriate for a man to have long hair. And you got big old long shaggy hair, beautiful, and you've been growing it out for years and you love it. And God says, you need to go over there and be a missionary. Should you cut your hair or should you leave it? You've got liberty in Christ to leave it. But you're going to be a stumbling block to, the, to those that you're trying to win for Christ. Now that's the, that's the point he's making there. He's not saying grab hold of this uh, specific abomination not saying grab a hold of this specific wicked thing, but there are things that you can do to assimilate in a way that you can become a blessing to people rather than a hindrance to them in your pursuit of them and giving them the gospel. So Paul and Dad made a great point there. And, and because of the way that they were doing things, he said in verse 24 of Romans chapter 2, he said, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. Because of the things that they were doing, their name was being blasph the, the name of God was being blasphemed among the Gentiles through them because of the way that they were going about things and being harsh about things. And he, I think in particular he might be talking about the Jews as a people, as a whole there. But anyways, let's get into the first part of Romans here. I um, don't want to take up a whole lot of time this evening, but I do want to get, as I was studying this evening, I got two words. Um, I got past two words that I, I was really studying out, and I hope to be able to ex expound upon these. Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. As I was looking at, these are kind of word studies here, as I was looking at that word servant, the uh, definition as far as biblically, we find a bondman. We find uh, uh, somebody that is purchased. Paul talks further about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. He said, what? There's a question here. Know ye not that your body is the temple 
of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. He said, For ye are bought with a price, therefore live unto yourselves, and the desire... Oh, that's the New Ignorant Version, I'm sorry. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. So if you're born again in here tonight, who does your body and your spirit belong to? The Lord. The Lord. Let me ask you a question. Write in your own mind a percentage of how often you do that. Take today. How much of today did you live for God? Or did you live just kind of anonymously forgetting God and just, you know, He wasn't even a thought in your mind? I was doing a lot of whining for Him to help me. <laughs> Please, Lord. How, how much have you lived to give your... Well, what did He say? He said... Let me find it here. He said... Where is it at? No, I'm sorry. I'm looking for... Um, Therefore, brethren, I beseech you by the mercies of God to present yourselves a living sacrifice. Is it Romans 12? That's where I turned to. Well, that's why, because I looked at Romans 11. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we find Paul in talking about servitude as something where he's purchased, and because of the purchase that has been placed upon him, because he is, he is bought with a price that his life needs to be reformed. It needs to be transformed. It needs to be radically changed from what it was. Now we also find servants in a different manner. Now if you're bought with a the price, then you should do that. You ought to do that. Amen? Amen. But let's look at it in another light. Because what a lot of people do, especially those that are sinless perfectionists, is they say, well, I'm going to do this because it's part of my salvation. Because if I don't live holy, then I'm going to hell if I sin. Uh, I know somebody very personal and very close to me that believes that if she were to say a curse word right before she died, that she'd go to hell. Yeah, I know people like that. She believes that wholeheartedly. She believes her salvation hangs in her hands. She believes that she's the one who took hold of Christ and not Him taking hold of her. She believes that, that she's holding the palm of His hand and not held in the palm of His hand. Yeah. That's not the way it is, church. Amen. But we, we want to we serve God in this way. Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 5, he said, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according, according to the word of the Lord. Moses died in the land of Moab. He was there, just about to go into the land. God said in verse number 4, He said, I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. But what Mo, the Lord said something pr quite remarkable about Moses here. He said, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. Let me ask you a question. Do you want your legacy of your life to be that you ended serving God? Or that you got born again and you were serving God, but then you kind of faded away and your faith was shipwrecked or, or what, what have you, and then you just kind of, you kind of died outside of fellowship with God? Which do you want? See, Paul was a servant like unto Moses that was going to serve the Lord into His death. A lot of us talk about how, you know, we'd be willing to die for God. And Dad talked about this. 
And Pastor talked about it. How how he knows people who said they'd be willing to die for God and, and nobody would stand in their way. Reminds you of Peter. He was willing, then he denied thrice. See, it's not so much about what you say, it's about what you do. Amen. Paul was a man not just of words, but of actions. He's a servant of the Lord's uh, sorry, the servant of the Lord's service flows not only to the Lord, but to the brethren. See, if you're serving God, you're not just going to serve God alone, but you're going to serve your brothers and sisters in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5, he says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Paul's life was a sacrifice not only to God, but for, uh, on behalf of the church of God, on behalf of the body of Christ. His life was lived as a sacrifice so that it would, it would glorify God and so that it would edify the brethren. Amen. The reason I'm, I'm saying this and what this has to do with the book of Romans here is the fact that Paul calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ. And they understand in those days what a servant is. Uh, uh, you know, years back people had men servants and now still they do in a lot of countries. Uh, there's countries like Dubai where billionaires go and, and they rent these exorbitant hotel rooms and when they rent them, uh, they go into them and as soon as they arrive, they have a manservant there. They have a, a personal butler that will be there every single time they arrive, no matter what time they arrive. They call and say, I'm going to be there in ten minutes. That butler's getting there quick. But the servant of the Lord, the servant of the Lord is something different. Because we're bought with the price, but guess what? We can slacken our service. But, but that doesn't take away the expectation for our service. Paul's representing to them that in those days they understood what a servant was. And he's saying, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. He's saying that my life is purchased. It's not only purchased, but it's one that I'm giving day in and day out in the Old Testament a servant. When his time was up serving, what he would do is say, you know, I love my master so much and I want to stay with him that I'm going to take my ear and I'm going to take an auger or, or a bore and I'm going to nail my ear to his front door so that people will recognize that I've laid claim on him and said that I will serve this one forever. He, 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 he made it known that he was one that was willing to spend the rest of his life in service to that master. Now, I'm not about piercing ears for men. Uh, but it seems like some of us need to do that in our walk with God. We need to pierce our ear to the door. We need to attach our ear to the door of our master. We need to be willing for people to know that we're a servant. We need, to, we need to have a life that people say, man, that person is living for Jesus, whether they dislike the way you're doing it or not. Whether they embrace it or they hate it. They're going to know that you're preaching about Jesus. And you know what most people do? They'll say, that's not the Jesus I believe in. The Jesus I believe in said, judge not, and that's it. The rest of the chapter has been erased. But that ain't the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible said, Judge not. And then He said the rest of the chapter. Amen. We need to be servants of Almighty God. And we need to be servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul's representing them, I'm a servant of Jesus. You understand what a servant is now? Now you understand why it was so important that he called himself a servant. He said, Called to be an apostle. In Acts 9 and verse 15, he said, He's a chosen vessel unto me, the Lord Jesus said. He, he, he's a chosen vessel unto me. Paul was set apart for a specific duty, a specific work that he would go out and, and, and preach and call the Gentiles to repentance. And he did that. 
I talked about it in the other service a, a while back. If you don't know your ministry, your first ministry is the ministry of reconciliation. How do you reconcile people to God if they, you don't tell them first that they've got a distance between them and God? See, most of us are so ashamed of our faith or embarrassed or scared about the reactions of other, that others that we're not willing to tell them where they lie and where they stand with God. Amen. We're not willing to step out and say, you know what? I love you. And it's really hard with loved ones, amen? I love you, but guess what? You're on your way to hell. There's a time and a place for that. I'm not saying at your Christmas dinner to stand up and start preaching the gospel to people unless the Holy Spirit moves. Uh, but don't do something foolishly and blame it on the Holy Spirit. But, but you need to reach out to those. You need to reach out to those that are lost. See, your call, Paul's call was not just to salvation simply. Nobody that I know ever in Scripture, was just called to salvation simply. Nobody's ever just called to salvation. God was called, Paul was called unto salvation, but he was called to be an apostle. He was separated under the gospel of God. He was called unto something. You're called unto a ministry of reconciliation as one that's born again. Nobody gets saved and gets to sit in the background and just enjoy the leisures of Christian life because there shouldn't be leisures in your life. Leisures should be the exception. Your life should be that one of, of service. I heard a street preacher one time. He was out preaching and somebody punched him right in the face. And then he punched him again. And the street preacher said, Thank you for the blessing, brother. Jesus loves you. Repent of your sins and be born again. And he punched him in the face again. He said, Thanks for the blessing. God bless you. Repent of your sins. And he punched him again. And he said it again. And he punched him again. And finally the crowd pulled him off of him. You know what most of us would do as soon as we got punched? We'd be going to the ground. We'd be going toe to toe. There's a time to fight. But there's also a time to stand there and take something for the glory of God. Amen. Sometimes us husbands, it's in the argument with our wives. Sometimes you wives, it's in the argument with your husband. Amen. Sometimes you should take the fault. You should, you, you should own up to what you did and not worry about them owning up to what they did. My wife can attest to this. A lot of times I get upset because I'll own up to something when I really know I've been wrong and she did something a little wrong and I'm like, she, why didn't she say sorry? Why didn't she say sorry? That's the wrong attitude. That's the wrong attitude. See, we got to be able to take the punch for Jesus and not only out on the evangelism field but in the home front. Amen? When your brother offends you and you had done something that they went off and offended you even more, guess what? You need to go to your brother and try and get reconciled. That's, right. Amen. That's another sermon for another time. Paul was called to be an apostle. Not to salvation simply. That, that's not it. Your life is not salvation. It's not. If you're born again, your life is not about your salvation. That might come as a shock to some of you, but your life as a born again believer is not about your salvation. It's about your relationship, your fellowship with God. And your fellowship with God will bring forth fruit. Amen. Amen. It will bring forth not only the fruit of the Spirit, but it will bring forth the fruits of works of the righteousness that God has ordained and set before you that you might walk in. You say, why do I have a struggle in my Christian life? Do you have fellowship with Jesus? Do you have fellowship with, uh, with God the Father? Do you have fellowship with the brethren? Do you? Amen. If you do, guess what? Then you're probably walking in the Spirit because you can't have fellowship with God without walking in the Spirit. And if you have fellowship with God, you ought to have fellowship with your brethren, even when they do uh, church hurt you, as they say. 
You ought to at least try and restore that fellowship. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, we went over the importance of him calling himself a servant so that they understood. Now he's, not, he's talking, he says in verse 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking to everybody at Rome, Jew and Gentile. He's saying, look, at, look I'm a servant. I, I'm telling you, I'm not only a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, but my life as a Christian, I'm going to live in service to the church of God, to the body of Christ, that he, I might present you a chaste virgin. He says in one place, We ought to be servants of Jesus Christ as Paul was. They in Rome should be servants of Jesus Christ as Paul was. What we like to do is we like to take great men and women in the Bible and we like to set them up on this pedestal and say, God could never use me like that. Now God can never use you as an apostle that can pen holy scriptures. Amen? Amen. He's not going to use you that way. The cannon's closed, but guess what? He can use you to go out and win souls for the glory of God. Amen. He can use you to sow seed. See, you've got him up on this pedestal. And Paul was all about taking that pedestal that people put him on and tearing it down and burning it down and, or, or shaving it down and making it a post for the tents that he made. He wasn't about being on a pedestal. He said, if I had something to, if anybody's got something to boast in, I do, but I won't, because it's all dung to me. So you get him off that pedestal, you give him honor, but you get him off the pedestal, and you quit saying, well, because they did such great stuff for Jesus, I can't live as well for Jesus. I can't live up to that, well, so I'm not going to live at all for him, is our attitude. That's the approach we take sometimes. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that he was one born out of due time. He was one born out of due time, not meet to be called an apostle. What he was telling them there in Corinth is he was saying, guess what, I ain't worthy either. Look at how greatly God's used me, but I still ain't worthy. I've been made accepted, but I ain't worthy. Some of us feel like we got to be worthy before God can use us. We just got to be willing. Yeah, man. That's right. He was separate under the gospel of God. In another place here in verse 9, he says, the gospel of his son. And in yet another, he says, my gospel. Chapter 2 and verse 15, he said it was my gospel, I believe. No, that's not where it's at. I don't have it right here. He was separated under something. Now, I'm not talking about all these people who are about super separation and, you know, Mennonites and all that. But I'm saying, you ought to live separated. These three words, servant, called, and separated, are very important. A lot of times when we read something... We're so busy looking for a big, heavy, uh, just astonishing doctrine that we don't look at the little things that are there for us. We want this, oh man, we want that big theological nugget that nobody's going to be able to pick up, but I'm going to get it, Lord, and I'm going to go and hand it out to everybody. That's not what I'm interested here. I'm not interested in blowing your mind. I hope that most of you understand what I'm saying that most of you at least had a bit of understanding about what I'm saying, and all I'm doing is helping to increase that through the Holy Ghost. That's what I hope. And if you didn't know it, glory to God, you know it now. Paul, he said he's a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. And as he gets into this next verse, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, there's a lot to be said there. Paul's looking back at the Scriptures. He's looking back at that Torah in the Old Testament and those prophets, as he, and he's saying, guess what? Uh, they was talking about this Jesus that you guys crucified. Uh, guess what? They was talking about Jesus whom you guys uh, 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 didn't even want to accept the Jews. Uh, and they was talking about Jesus. 
Jesus, Jesus. Concerning His Son, Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, He ties in the fact that He had a birth here and that He was sent by God and that He was of the lineage of David. Therefore, He had the claim to the throne to be the king, which, guess what? He's still going to be the king. He's the king on high, but eventually He's going to come back and take the kingdoms of this world and make them His own. So declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of Holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for His sake. For obedience to the... Let me read that in another way. For obedience to the faith among all nations, we have received grace and apostleship. apostleship. When, when you walk in obedience and faith to God, guess what? He's going to give you more ground to walk on. I was watching a brother and he had just gone out street preach for his first time. He said, he said it was the busiest place in town. And when I went out there at the busiest time, ten people walked by. For his first time street preaching. He said, I'm not discouraged. God's telling me that I ain't prepared to minister to a lot of people. He said, but I'm going to be obedient and faithful and God will send more. You may not be prepared for that mountain that you want to climb so that you can look really good in front of the brothers and sisters in Christ. We kind of lift people up and we shouldn't do that. We should edify the brethren and we should hold every, uh, uh, everyone above ourselves, but we shouldn't lift them up in, a, in, in that kind of way. You understand what I'm talking about. I'm running out of time. I don't want to go over too much. Um, what I want you guys to do is I want you to go through and read Romans. Read Romans. Read the book of Acts and Romans. Just read the whole thing. We're going to pick back up on this on Sunday night. Um, we're going to, I'm not going to do this the whole time. It's not going to be a, a word study on every single verse. Uh, I'm not going to do that to you all because it would take us about forever to get through this. Uh, but I do want to give you the meat where the meat's at. And I want to give you the background and give you context of what he's saying and why he's saying it. Uh, did anybody here not know about the issue in Rome where the Jews had been expelled? Everybody knew the Jews got expelled from Rome. Well, that's good. That means you read your Bible or you was listening to somebody who was reading their Bible. Amen. Now you understand that there was a context there of the problem in Rome. Maybe gives you some context, gives you a little light. Why, why did Paul decide to not go through, uh, sail to Syria and go to Macedonia because the Jews were waiting for him? Apparently they wanted to do something bad to him. What did he have with him? What did he have at that point in time? He had something that he was taking somewhere. Well, he had, he had something that I forgot to take up. He had the offering. For the church at Jerusalem. For the poor saints at Jerusalem. He had the offering for the saints. So what did them Jews probably want? A man. So that gives you a little context to what's going on there. He had an offering. He was trying to go over there. He wanted to get to Jerusalem so he could give him the offering uh, for those saints. But he ended up going a different way because God set something in his, in his path that, that, that encouraged him to go a different way. Sometimes we want to get somewhere real fast. It would have been quicker to sail to Syria. It would have been quicker. But he had to go all the way up and around the coast. And If you have a map in front of you, it makes a lot more sense. You know, He's here and he's got to go up and around the coast and then down through to Jerusalem. He could have went to Syria and bam, and then down to Jerusalem. But God set forth for him to go a different way. There's much exhortation to the church of God. Amen. All right, we'll be dismissed in prayer. Pastor, would you dismiss us? Father, I ask the Lord to help us to be able to, to hold in. I thank you for what you gave me tonight, Lord. I thank you for the revelation. I pray, Lord, that your word will accomplish the, the, the target. Lord, the, the edification where you sent Father, I ask you for old mercy as we go from this building. Father, help us to be walking in the vocation that you called us in. 
I pray, Lord, that we would be workmen, your workmen, called into good works. Help us to maintain these. In Jesus' holy and precious name, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to ask you all quickly, number one, pray for me as I'm doing this. Because uh, it's, it's, it's one thing to preach... Uh, uh, a topical sermon, but to go through and do a do an exegetical study out of a text is very daunting, and it's a fearful thing for me because uh, you can say some stuff while you're preaching, um, but when you're doing an exegetical study, there's some things that you can't just say, and uh, I don't mean that to shame anybody saying something while they're preaching, especially myself. But you know, you gotta you gotta deal with the text that's in front of you, and you can't insert things or just personal ideas you got to kind of deal with the text there and not add to stuff uh, which we don't try to as preachers anyways pastor doesn't do that dad doesn't do that i mean uh peewee doesn't do that we try not to do that but uh uh it's it's kind of a daunting task and I, it's a fearful thing for me pray for that number two choir practice yeah, five, five o'clock on sunday so I encourage you to be here. I've got some songs here from an old uh, songbook that I had. Um, if you guys have any songs that want to be in the choir and want to help out with that, uh, let me know. Bring them in. Bring a few copies. And maybe it's something we can learn. And uh, we'll try and get assembled and get in order and decent about things. Uh, so I encourage you to pray about that and pray about singing with the choir. Amen. Amen. That's a good idea. Amen. <laughs> Praise Amen. the Lord. All right.